so whatever whatever you need works out there. Yeah, you're taller than me, so I have to put a little bit lower. <laughs> <laughs> whatever works, dude. Episode 43, something for everyone, Federico Zuccarelli, dude. Am I hey. saying the full name right? Yep, Federico Zuccarelli. That's my name, man. Hell yeah. I'm realizing I've never said the full thing. I've always seen it written, but you've always been fed to me in person. Maybe Federico once in a while. Yeah, 100%. Zuccarelli is a new flavor for me to get on my mouth. Yeah. Um, dude, I appreciate you coming through episode 43, something from everyone. So the show started with the idea of learning something from everyone. And as I look back through my like history and music and all the people and places I've been through, it's been fun to like, yeah, touch on little moments of it. And the Kachuk Paradise moment and learning from you on guitar is a huge moment for me in like the, the formative years. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, I guess not learning guitar from you, but just learning yeah. art from you, learning from you guys about how this whole thing works, about what being in a band means. Uh, so it's fun to have you on and kind of dive back into those, those early glory years for me. Yeah, and uh, first and foremost, I really appreciate it. Um, just the fact that you got some inspiration from that, that's really cool. Um, where I'm at in life now is I just want to make things yeah. to smile. And uh, to be in Construct Paradise was a lot of smiles, a lot of uh, good times, a lot of uh, maybe not so good times. <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, but it was... Um, awesome to be in a group like that. I've never been in a joint venture like that ever in my entire life. Mm -hmm. So it was really cool. Um, I just had, you know, uh, Kevin messaged me on Facebook basically one day and that's basically how it started. I just drove myself up from Greenwich, Connecticut to mm -hmm. Simsbury, Connecticut. And then we started having a way at it, man. And we made a really cool, and I, I, they already had a cool thing going, but mm -hmm. I jumped on it and yeah. I got to write two solos for Haunt Me and Personal Vendetta. Mm -hmm. And it was really awesome, man. It was such, such a good time and I learned a lot from it too. Absolutely, man. I'd love to dive into all that. Before we get into stuff, is there anything people should know that you're creating art now? Where can people find what you're creating now? What are you up to currently that people should be aware of? Yeah, so um, basically uh, what I'm doing with art is I just... I'm a very free form person, very oh, yeah. improv improvisational, whether it be um, my life or my music. So whatever comes to mind is basically what I'm trying to produce now. Um, yeah, I have songs and stuff in the woodworks and all that stuff, but uh, some days I'm inspired by rock metal music. Some days I'm inspired by electronica music. Some days I'm inspired by other things. So I just like to put one minute, two minute clips and mm -hmm. just put them out there into the ether as opposed to me just holding stuff in. I just want yeah. to release whatever ideas I have. Yeah. So if you can find me on YouTube, Federico Zuccarelli official, Instagram, Federico Zuccarelli official. Um, and um, I released a song actually recently called Daisy. It's my first... Um, it's my first guitar-based song uh, that I've done uh, in a very, very long time. I've oh, been yeah, doing yeah. a lot of hip-hop for mm -hmm. the past couple of years. <laughs> I love it. No, I appreciate it. And I think my interests are equally diverse and I'm always related to you. Uh -huh. like, there's a million things we're into. And I've always been kind of envious of the kid who's like, I'm a deathcore kid. And all I want to do is write blast beats and figure out blast beats. And I think Shoot, I've always identified yeah. with you of like, now there's a hundred different things I'm interested in. And how do I like address all these hundred interests and make them all work cohesively together yeah uh, so i love it i think you have a great kind of summary of the construct paradise days and all the yeah ups and downs there uh before we get into that i wanted to dive into where things start for you like where are you as a where does guitar come into your life I, it seems like it would have been in your blood from yeah when you were two <laughs> or three you would have learned to walk and learn guitar at the same time but yeah where does things start for you um so for me my guitar journey started um I would say I was like eight years old and my dad got me a classical guitar and I took some lessons. Yeah. So I started playing guitar very early, learned like Mary Had a Little Lamb, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> all the heavy stuff. Uh, yeah, the super heavy stuff. And then um, I basically gave it up. It was just kind of like a thing I just did for a second. Mm -hmm. And then when I was uh, 12 or 13, um, I saw a Stratocaster at Guitar Center and um, I was like, Dad, you need to buy this for me. I need to play guitar music and mm -hmm. stuff i just uh i loved ozzy osbourne um his old band black sabbath um i loved all that stuff and i just wanted to be one of those dudes that plays guitar like that so mm -hmm. my dad got me a stratocaster and i was pretty much uh a freak with it i just played it uh as soon as i got home i just played it for hours this mm -hmm. i it, it's just that was my lifeline at one point man it still yeah. is but i just it's just one of those things where like you play a couple of notes and then Three hours later, you're still sitting there. And that was me as a kid. I just played for hours and hours, and I just loved mm -hmm. it. I loved it. I love that process, and I like hearing it and reminding myself that that's what learning is, that I think we see people who are good at something, and I see you being good at guitar, and it's like, oh, he's just good at guitar. And it's like, uh -huh. well, yes, you are, but that's a result of all these years of sitting in your bedroom and figuring it out note mm -hmm. by note and session by session and building this over time. Uh, I think it's a reminder for me to, yeah, 
understand that that's what this process is, that it is about those late nights of figuring stuff out and not being confident and not necessarily believing in it, but of continuing to see the path through and figuring out what the next, I don't know, the next chord is for you, what the next rhythm is. You got to figure out what the next, yeah, pattern the end need to make happen is. Yeah, it's, um, uh, Joe Rogan has described it pretty good when it comes to the mountain of success. The mountain of success is painted by thin brush strokes. It's almost like a thin layer of paint Mm -hmm. and then another thin layer of paint. It's not even like, um, it's not even bricks. You'd think it would be like that. Maybe for some other people it is like that, but it really Mm -hmm. is. It's just thin layers that constantly grow and become this mountain of who you are. So I really uh, like that analogy because I remember being in college that they'd have like the rocks on campus that always paint. And if you like cut into the rocks, it's like a, I guess like a tree kind of thing Mm -hmm. where you see like the rings of each layer of paint, but it's a very, I don't know, it's a very physical thing because layers of paints that students have done. Of course, they're all frats painting it for whatever dumb charity they were trying to raise for. I guess dumb charity is a terrible phrase that I shouldn't use there. Ah, dude, you're Um, all good, man. But whatever cause, yeah, whatever philanthropic cause they were uh, pursuing in that moment. Uh, And so you get the real really physical reminder of all these people that have been here and used this rock as a, as a sentimental thing. Uh, and I like that cause that is physical layers of paint and this rock ends up enormously bigger than it was. Uh, and I like that. Yeah. It's the same analogy there of building up skill of building up experience of stuff that it is these minute layers that feel like nothing. It's imp- almost mm-hmm. impossible to think that you could double the size of a rock by painting it every day. But in theory, yeah, you could, it would just keep becoming and snowballing, I guess, to use that term. Yeah, and um, even and and sometimes it's crazy. You don't even think about it, but all the setbacks and mm-hmm. the falling on your face, that kind of thing that happens in your life, mm-hmm. those are some of the most important lessons you could possibly ever learn and take with you um, to teach other people as well as um, your next generation of who you are, and just um, yeah, let's just try to make little impacts and just try to mm-hmm. be. Uh, positive that's my main thing that i try to do recently is just try to be um a positive force not for myself but for those around me my fiance uh my direct family uh, my best friends um especially um during you know the past negative times that we all experienced these past couple of years yeah um it's just the circle that's it that's all Mm -hmm. we have um and for me uh god's a big part of it um I, i i try to channel something that's positive and i just want that to come out because uh there's a lot of negativity in this world peter absolutely <laughs> i'm gonna turn that fan off for two seconds 100 percent should have done this should have done that before oh dude it's all good yeah i end up putting that fan in the window and then moving it over here at the last minute to just give us a little little freshness uh, as you were chatting it reminds mm-hmm. me of this uh teddy roosevelt quote that i've brought up a hundred times on this show it's a great uh, guy. but there's one part in the middle of it that i always forget over uh and the quote was the man in the arena and it's about the, the value of being the one pursuing the art and that you by pursuing it, you have all the ability to to talk about it and the people in the stands don't have anything to say about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but one part in the middle of that that I love is that there's it's like there's no effort without errors and shortcomings. Uh, yeah. And that's always been something that's yeah. uh, part of that that I really like is like part of being the man in the arena isn't that you win every game. Part of being the man in the arena means you got to lose and be embarrassed and sometimes it doesn't go well. And mm-hmm. that's part of it and probably the more valuable part of it all, right? I think when I look back on what is shaped me into what I am and what has given me gifts or given me hard work, what has made me better. It's those moments, right? It's not the times where someone gave me the silver platter of like, mm-hmm. here's this great thing. Like those kind of came and went and the things that have stuck that have, I think really added to my character were the things that, yeah, took a lot of figuring out to get through and to get by. Yeah. I mean, uh, if you analyze some of those that may have gotten the silver platter, AKA child stars, what happens to every childhood star, man? Yeah. <laughs> they're they're not they don't end up too good in their twenties. The least silver of all the platters, I <laughs> yeah. think I would argue. But yeah, it's a it's a very strange gift to be given as a kid, where it's yeah, perhaps mm-hmm. the worst curse you could give a kid, and it's mm-hmm. uh, veiled in all these glorious things that mm-hmm. don't amount to much, oftentimes. Yeah, um, and I could also relate to the silver platter thing. I grew up pretty damn privileged. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up, uh, my family definitely had some money. I got mm-hmm. to go to a lot of places that maybe other people haven't gone to. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, I've been to Europe, I've been to South America, I've done uh, really cool adventures and all that good stuff. Um, so it, it gave me a, a nice perspective on how, um, what the biggest perspective is that there's all these other people around the world and mm-hmm. relatively, we are, relatively speaking, we're all the same. We're, we all operate yep. on some sort of uh, frequency or vibration, whatever hippy dippy thing you want to call it, but mm-hmm. we're all essentially the same people just growing uh, into whatever's the next iteration. I 100%, yeah, the two things came to my brain there. One uh, is the idea of privilege, and I agree. I grew up in a town that is 
yeah, generally privileged compared to others. And I think mm-hmm. that my family wasn't at the top of the town, but we were also uh-huh. in the town. We were, yeah, equally yeah. privileged. And we would, as a high schooler, yeah, you'd go play the other towns and be like, oh, this school looks a lot different than ours. And slowly <laughs> that starts to realize like, oh, yeah, we're very fortunate, very lucky to be there. Um, and then, of course, as I get into music, I think there was always a weird thing of like music's about a struggle. And I don't quite feel the struggle. I don't quite identify with that. Mm-hmm. And of course, life has a way of finding finding its own way to challenge you to oh, introduce struggle. Um, but part of that was that my mom grew up in South America. She grew up in Chile. Oh, shoot. Uh, and so we would go back there every three or four years. That was like our we wouldn't go to Florida every year. It was like mm-hmm. every three or four years we go to South America for two weeks. And that yeah. was our family vacation. Um and there was one time we're going there and I'm maybe 10, 12, 8, like somewhere in these like I'm not quite an adult anymore. I'm not quite an adult or teenager, but I'm not really a kid anymore. I'm kind of in that that mm-hmm. middle era. And I remember like going from the airport to my mom's city and on the way into the city we have to drive by these like I don't know shanty towns or whatever. Yeah, totally. And it was the first time that like coming from Connecticut, we don't have a lot of homelessness around here. We don't have a lot of what feels like true poverty in the way that we see homelessness in major cities, you know, the LA kind of thing of like, that is horrific suffering that doesn't exist around here, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Um, But I remember being like seeing that as a kid and it was the first time of like, Oh, that could be me that like, I'm very blessed to not be me because Mm -hmm. there's no reason it shouldn't have been like, there's uh, yeah, I was born here. I was born to these two parents who loved me and was very grateful and took, yeah, put me in a house that was uh, set up for me to succeed in. Yeah. But I very well could have been one of these other people who was born with very limited opportunity, very limited privilege. Uh, And I think, yeah, it was a really eye opening thing to, as you talk about travel, I think that, yeah, that's something I look back as a kid of like, I don't know how much I remember about being in Chile and really soaking that up, Mm -hmm. but I remember that. I remember exploring the world and realizing how much bigger this thing was than just me and how lucky I was to be in my little corner of it even. That's way cool. You know, I had no idea that you had, uh, you had a family life like that. Mm -hmm. That's so, so interesting because, uh, both my parents were born in Italy, so okay, cool. I've been to Italy a couple of times and all that good stuff. Um, you know, I, there's no like crazy poverty or anything that, mm-hmm. like that, but it's cool to connect with you that you you have some foreigners in your family like me. <laughs> <laughs> it's been fun. Yeah, I think that's been the. I'm glad you said that because that's been kind of the crux of the fun of the podcast to I me. Mean, so many people like you, though. It's like I had no idea that you, yeah, your parents came here from Italy. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. You find these common grounds and conversations that we wouldn't have had otherwise. I mean, if my Italian um, ass name didn't give it away, <laughs> <laughs> I figured it was somewhere in the blood. Yeah. Uh, Hallie, do you remember? Do you have memories of going to Italy? Like, was oh, it? Oh yeah for sure um yeah my uncle had a boat in italy so we'd go out on the water and it was i've never been in like open water before but Mm -hmm. that was scary but cool at the same time um all the cobblestone streets and the cuisine and people is Mm -hmm. just so interesting and vibrant um whether it be eating at super late hours and uh enjoying your time or um it's just uh, it's a different way of life. I do love it and respect it, uh, but I'm also a New England kid. I gotta keep it going, man. I, I, I'm not a lazy dude like uh, like some people, so <laughs> I just gotta you know keep it keep it rolling and all that stuff. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. I think that's perhaps one of the the challenges of coming from privilege. You know, and I think that. Mm-hmm. Privilege has a huge range, and I hate using that word. It sounds like we're talking about growing up in LA mansions as Kanye. Kanye is the wrong Kim Kardashian's kid. No, uh, yeah. but it's like I don't think that's what we're talking about. But there is Absolutely levels not. to this game, yeah. And we're not, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, we're not that rich, but we're fortunate in, the, in other ways. But I think that yeah. also makes it tough sometimes to when we're talking, yeah, in the context of music, in the context of art, it's like it doesn't quite feel like it's made for that. It made feels like it's made for people coming through adversity. Like, was it hard for you mm-hmm. to? get into a place where it feels like music yeah, is written for people coming out of adversity. And what I think we identify or similar, uh, similarly have is that a childhood that was fortunate to be minimal in adversity of normal. Yeah. I'm sure there was normal ups and downs and certainly I had my own yeah. ups and downs that got mm-hmm. introduced. Um, but yeah, in the context of music and the context of art, was it weird to be looking at all these starving, struggling artists? And mm-hmm. for me, it was always like a self-conscious thing of like, can I be as good as them if I didn't have this fucked up upbringing? If, yeah, I can absolutely relate to that. Um, and for me, um, most people's rebellion would be like, um, I don't know, just the standard like rebellious stuff. I can't really describe it at mm-hmm. the moment, but my uh, my rebellion was death metal music. My sure. rebellion yeah. was getting into deathcore. My rebellion was black metal, uh, duh, fucking uh, all the Norwegian cats. Mm-hmm. Um uh, and all the thrash metal that I got into, Voivod, Destruction, Sodom, mm-hmm. um, 
it was just one of those things where that was my outlet where other kids uh, maybe had a distressed upbringing and that kind of thing. For me, it was, um, I really got heavily, heavily into death metal uh, music, the lyrics, the um, grotesque um, horror about it. Mm -hmm. I'd be in class writing freaking death metal <laughs> lyrics, and I'd have like the, the girl behind me being like, oh, what the hell, man? So uh, that was my form of rebellion, and um, through it, um, I really... Uh, I joined Construct Paradise. Um, mm -hmm. I got to be in Shadow of Intent for a second. Um, and it was uh, amazing to go through all that. But after um, doing all that, I realized that it really was my rebellion. I don't listen to death metal music anymore, Peter. I don't mm -hmm. listen to anything with like harsh l lyrics or anything, even like yep. the, the guttural vocal style. Sure. I respect it so much. I know it takes um, so much ability. And at one point in my life, I really did uh, vibrate with that and mm -hmm. really did enjoy that. But now um, at this point in my life that I'm in, I'm 27 now. Um, I really like things that have a more so um, introspective and maybe perhaps positive message as opposed to that. I think I can identify to that with some degree. Yeah, I, I listen to a lot more rap now than I do metal. And yeah. uh, someone uh, recently told me that they used the term ear fatigue there. And I think to some degree it's correct because like, I'm just working in metal so much that when I mm -hmm. have free time, when I'm just playing something in the background, like I need a different flavor of something. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's to some degree that, but I think you're right that it is just, a, yeah, we age our, our or uh, interest mature and, and things grow. It's good to get into hip hop too, because like uh, hip hop music was something I actually did enjoy while mm -hmm. I liked death metal, but not the standard hip hop. You would probably, mm -hmm. uh, um, I really liked um, when I was a sophomore in high school and I was riding the bus um, home. Uh, had a crazy senior would always freaking sit next to me and he'd always show me like new sounds. He'd be like listening to like weird sound wave music, or sorry, like the like. I don't even know how to describe it, but he always mm. showed me, show me some weird tunes. Um, and one artist he showed me was Death Grips, and that like changed my life when he showed me um, what rap music could be. Yep. Uh, I never knew who Zach Hill was was as a drummer. Um, I never knew who MC Ride was, and I never knew that music could be like that, where it's almost like your emotions and feelings are just all on the track and it doesn't matter how gritty it is or how sonic sounding it is it's just it is what it is mm -hmm. and that's a statement i live by it is what it is it's not what you make it it definitely is what it is <laughs> I, I like that uh, i'm going back a little bit i'm laughing your dad getting you the the stratocaster yeah, thing you're yeah. gonna play like clapped in and all this like classical like soothing yeah, guitar didn't and then you get into way. all this nightmare <laughs> stuff and you're writing death metal lyrics and classic yeah, set yeah yeah definitely <laughs> i was like hey dad can you get me like a bc rich warlock i wanted more pointy shaped guitars <laughs> yeah. and all that kind of stuff Stuff and uh, but I've I've you know I I love those those neoclassical guitarists Ingve Malmsteen those shredders Paul Gilbert Steve Vai I love all that stuff and that was some of the first stuff I learned was like you know first thing I ever learned was like you know freaking that cream riff and then uh, getting into like uh, I was really heavily into Ozzy Osbourne so mm -hmm. I was uh, playing Bark at the Moon Crazy Train that kind of stuff I got into all the different guitarists that used to be in Ozzy whether it be Randy Rhodes Jakey e. Lee mm -hmm. or Zach Wild it's just cool seeing how like um giant bands can like uh get all these new artists and have these new different iterations and you can see mm -hmm. like the different sounds that are made into um all these different things I'm a little bit off on a tangent but you know what i mean absolutely yeah <laughs> uh are you able to like enjoy bands the same as lineups change where i always find myself like long for the the old lineup and i have a really tough time being like no that was one chapter and this is chapter two where I, uh -huh. yeah, I have a really tough time separating that. There's yeah. something, it sounds like you appreciate that. You almost enjoy the new variety and the new ideas coming in. Yeah, I was a little bit of a weird kid when it came to metal music, for sure, because I, I do enjoy switch-ups and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. Like, for a, a big one, for instance, is Black Sabbath, um, Transitioning Vocalists. Um, one of my favorite albums by Black Sabbath is Mob Rules, and that's literally Ronnie James Dio as the vocalist, which is one of the best vocalists of all time. So it's just cool um, seeing how bands transition. Even Van Halen, when Van Halen went from uh, David Lee Roth to Sammy Hagar, I liked a lot of that stuff. I'm not mm -hmm. gonna lie, I like the original Van Halen a little bit better, but it is what it is, man. Yeah. I just like I like different stuff, and it goes with the whole improv thing. Um, I try to treat everything as an improvisation, even solos and what I write online. It's usually all one takes. I usually don't take the time to. Um, 
syncopate everything and write like one bar, one bar, one bar, one bar. I like to have a free flowing idea. And then if I really like the free flowing idea, maybe I'll go back in and record it better. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes the free flowing idea, that's just what's on the track. Interesting. Uh, has it always been that way for you? Did you used to take a more, I don't want to say calculated, feels like the wrong word. No, a more, I, uh, I don't know. I'm, what's the word I'm looking for? A more like micromanaging approach. I feel like yeah, yeah. songs are normally written like note by note, like you're mm -hmm. in the studio and it is literally note by yes. note sometimes yes. or some version of that. And what you're saying is, yeah, the complete opposite of that. Where does this mm -hmm. shift start to change for you? Um, I would say that um, I first got introduced to actual like uh, that sort of, I guess, micromanaging. We'll say there's a better word for it. Yeah, but, forget, um, I don't want to say intentional or direct. I'm trying to figure out what the Maybe like having a strategy to it or something, whatever. But that uh, almost feels like, I don't want to say what you're doing is lacking strategy because I don't think that's fair either. You know I think what? it's a unique strategy and it's a different one, but I don't think it's fair to say I think, that. I think having, yeah. I think st song structure is the right word. Okay. It's like having the structure. Um, and uh, that was my f going into a band and, and then writing solos and that kind of stuff. That was my first iteration of like, oh, we're writing part by part by part by part, hmm. which um, is awesome. It's freaking awesome. Every way of making music is freaking awesome. And there's a lot of uh, benefits and also drawbacks on everything. So hmm. music's just it. Oh, music's man. awesome, man. <laughs> I OK, so I've been obsessed. I've, uh, I've been working a lot with green screens lately. And I've really been yeah. enamored by this idea that like, Anything we can do practically, we can do on a green screen. So like if we're filming in a warehouse, I can make that same warehouse digitally. And once I make it digitally, that means I can make it better. So I can make it taller, mm -hmm. bigger. I could add more windows if we wanted. I could add more lights if we wanted. Yeah. Like it, by having a physical warehouse that we're filming and it's almost limiting compared to what I can do digitally. Mm -hmm. And what the common argument, I think, against that is like, oh, I'm, I'm removing a human element from it. I'm removing some like organic creativity. And yeah. I think that's there. But I'm uh, I'm laughing going back to what you're saying about writing a song piece by piece. It's like the original song isn't organic and natural normally. Like, what are we yeah, talking about? The video absolutely. has to be all organic and natural. Absolutely. It's like, no, usually the song is, as you're saying, it's written. There's four takes layered over each other. And each mm -hmm. take was written piece by piece, chunk by chunk. in mm -hmm. some or tracked that way and maybe even written that way. Yeah. Um, but certainly tracked that way, that it wasn't tracked as a three minute performance. I mean, that's mm -hmm. probably unheard of. I can't think of anyone off the top of my head. Maybe you're aware of something. But well, that's it's how it used to be for like Led Zeppelin and a lot of bands mm -hmm. in that era. But I mean, if we have the technology now, you you should use it. It's, mm -hmm. it's not like we should not use the technology now. There's definitely a way to go about it that's more like organic. Mm -hmm. um, but we should use the technology that we have, um, even whether it be AI. <laughs> we should use what we have now and yeah. use it to our best advantage whilst still uh, being true to ourselves. And I, I think you can definitely accomplish that by using a green screen. I don't see any uh, downsides I, to that at all. I've been, yeah, uh, to me, I agree with you. And I think it uh, allows me an unlimited creativity where I did a video in like the salt flats and that's, that's Utah, that's Argentina. And That's it's like, crazy. I was never going to get a local band <laughs> to there. Uh -huh. I was never going to, yeah, I'm never going to get there, much less get me and five uh -huh. other people out there. But it's like now digitally, we can make that happen. I can bring this idea to life. So I would argue mm -hmm. that I'm not reducing creativity. I am unlimiting. I'm taking all the the, the restrictions off of creativity and saying, yeah. what, what do I want to make? And now I don't have to do anything other than make it. I don't have to find somewhere. I don't have to figure out a time or day. It's like... It can be 3 a.m. on a Tuesday morning. And yes. bingo, let's make a desert. Yes. <laughs> it's time to go. <laughs> that's, that's you know, the era that we're in now. Um, yeah. It's just, uh, it's so beautiful um, for me getting back into guitar making music and realizing um, we're now in the era of amp sims where I don't even need to have a mm -hmm. head, a stack, a cab, or anything like that. I can literally download a program into my computer and utilize it and have the best guitar tones ever yep. really undiscernible from an actual um organic amplifier and thousands of amplifiers right not just the one 5150 head that you want yeah. but like any 5150 from from the day they were first made to the one that came out yesterday and of course the same for any other uh and, yeah head. and i love and i love that it's all become open source to this emergence of open source is beautiful whether it be you're mm -hmm. using like a neural dsp where artists which i use uh, which artists can actually they put their own presets in there. So it's yep. like you can sound like the contortionist if you want to. You can sound like um, whatever freaking artist you want to, and you yep. can literally go into an artist preset, change a couple of things here and there, and then it's like, boom, that's your own preset basically. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool how open sourced um, this life is becoming. Um, there's obviously drawbacks to that, mm -hmm. um, whether it be maybe certain artists sounding too similar to other people or whatever of that nature, but I think it's a net positive overall. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I've I've had to 
uh, I don't know. I've had to be aware of the AI thing of like it does. It mm-hmm. is relevant to what I'm doing. It's relevant to my art. It's relevant to every art. I think. Yeah. Uh, and I think I'm no different in that. Uh, and I finally was joking that I used the other day to like generate clouds in an image of the Photoshop has like a new oh, like sweet. AI generative fill thing where you can yeah. yeah the highlight a thing and type put a house and it'll generate five houses that could be there pretty Uh, cool man it was pretty wild Uh, but i was also loving like it's not that successful like as i typed clouds it's like it took a it gave me a lot of hurricanes a lot of stuff like that's not Mm -hmm. (laughs) that doesn't make like it is a cloud i get what you're Mm -hmm. saying Uh, but it was kind of a nice refresher for me of like it is powerful but it still takes a human to sift through all the bullshit it can spit out and dissect that or sift that down into something that's of value um, we started talking about getting into guitar and then had a fun time going everywhere else. Uh, where did guitar start to become more serious for you? So you, in like middle school-ish, you're starting to like write by yourself. When does like a first band come into the picture? When are you starting to, yeah, put out solo songs? What kind of starts to become real for you um, first there? Um, yeah, I don't even know if you could find this on the internet, but I was in, uh, when, I think I was in either eighth grade or ninth grade. So I was either a, a freshman in high school or the last year of middle school and I joined like a, like a pop punk band called yeah. uh, Drastic Action. That's uh, such a funny. That feels like such a long way away from you. That's such a funny yeah. first band for you to have. Well, I was wearing like <laughs> uh, death metal shirts, and I was playing pop punk. Uh, okay. And we played like um, one battle of the bands at the porch at like Porchester High School. Huge. I, <laughs> so so that was that. But it was really fun, man. It was it was cool. Like that was like my first being in a band thing, going mm-hmm. to a place, practicing with people, being like, oh, dude, we're gonna do this. It's gonna look <laughs> so course. cool live, all that kind of stuff. It's like so. high school friends, or yeah, where uh, do you meet these people? Who are these people? Um, yeah, there's it was just kind of like people I knew in town. I was always like the younger person mm-hmm. in every band that I've been in. I was always like the a couple years younger guy. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was just kind of like a couple older, older kids came up to me. They're like, oh, you play guitar? I was like, yeah, I do play guitar. I showed them like tremolo picking and all that kind of stuff. And they're like, oh, that's totally not our style, but you can definitely play the, what we're playing. So, yeah. um, it was it's just funny. cool to do that, man. And then, uh, yeah, from that, I just, uh, continued to play guitar by myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, just always in my room. That was like my thing. Like, uh, if you were to ask me if I could do one thing to the day I die, it's just, it'd just be like, okay, put me in a room with, with a guitar. That'd mm-hmm. be it. I'd be pretty, uh, pretty, that'd be like the one thing probably. <laughs> yep. Um, so it was just kind of like playing guitar by myself, posting little clips on social media. I had like a really old YouTube channel that probably doesn't exist anymore. Um, where I would post up some stuff and then, um, the goal of the show is to get big enough that all these things we've talked about that we don't think people can find end up getting found. Oh man. Yeah, <laughs> That's be, when you know that the thing has succeeded. Yeah. yeah that'd be pretty bad. There's some cringy videos on there. <laughs> I, say, I, believe, yep, I have old like vocal covers out there somewhere oh, that I'm sure yeah, that like dude. I've done my best to get rid of, but I'm sure that yeah, yeah in, yeah, in yeah. the context of the universe, someone would dig them up if, if I got there. hundred percent, hundred percent, man. But uh, that's but, cool. Yeah. Freaking from doing that and just playing my, my stuff and then putting it on the internet and all that stuff. You know, a dude from Simsbury, Kevin, hit me up. Uh, Kevin Lang, who's in Euclid now, one of a really big mm-hmm. band, really cool band. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just uh, I, we just instantly connected, and then we were like, yeah, come up. And I did, like, one band practice, and then I was basically in the band that mm-hmm. day. So uh, from then, I was in Construct Paradise for a couple of years. Um, my memory gets a little hazy, so I don't exactly know how many years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was super fun. We uh, like being a local, local like almost it's being an LBH local band hero. <laughs> being a local band hero is cool, man. Yeah. Just playing with all like the local dudes from around the area. You meet a lot of new friends and all that good stuff. Um, playing like people's birthday parties and stuff <laughs> like that. Just those kind of gigs. Yep. It was just really fun. And then um, to have my first excursion. Um, and to join a, a bigger band like Shadow of Intent and do like a music video for them yeah. and all that stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was a crazy transition for me. Um, for myself personally, I went through a lot of emotional stuff at the at the time. Like me leaving Construct Paradise was like really hard for me and stuff like that. Um, it was like uh, very emotional for everyone in the band. Um, lots of tears. <laughs> but um, after that, um, you know, I basically I jumped ship and joined Shadow of Intent. Um, and then I never realized the amount of pressure that um, I can put on myself. Um, so 
I just, uh, you know, I had to do my own thing, man. I just quit mm-hmm. everything. Freaking, I was a barista at the time, slinging coffee, man. So I kept slinging coffee and kept yeah. doing my own thing, living my life. Um, <laughs> and then I landed uh, my corporate gig, which I do now. I've been doing it for over five years. I'm a route service representative at Unifirst, um, and I really enjoy it. I make a good salary. I do what I do. I get every, get every weekend off, that kind of thing. So mm-hmm. it's like now that i have the um material components aka dolores <laughs> now that i have that man um i can just do what i want to do live yeah. my life um be as smooth as I, I can possibly be in this crashing waves of life and mm-hmm. just kind of meander my way through make music wherever i can just make myself happy that's like the number one thing is if i can make myself happy maybe other people will like it if they don't that's cool. If they do, that's cool too, man. It's whatever, whatever, however it spins, man. <laughs> I think that's really noble. And yeah, I really love that. And I really respect that about you and your, pre- yeah, your approach to all this stuff of like, I think you've done a really good job of saying what makes me happy and following that kind of undeniably, it feels, or unwaveringly of just beelining it towards whatever makes you happy. And I think that's really admirable in the context of so many bands get caught up with like, what's cool? What should we be? And it's oh, like, I feel yeah. like you've been good of like, no, what, who am I? What am I going to be? And exploring that path. And I think we're all exploring that path. And I'm sure you would, I'm sure you would say, and I'm sure I would say that, yeah, we're all still exploring that path. It's not a oh, done journey by any means, but yeah. uh, I appreciate that you've been, yeah, fearless, I guess, in pursuing that. Uh, I would say uh, fearless as though Icarus going too close to the <laughs> sun kind of fearlessness sure. where I had to, you know, hit the ground and realize Oh man, that hurt. <laughs> yeah, but um, it, f- through that, I developed a love for hip hop music. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I developed a love for um, bedroom pop. I developed a love for breakbeat. I developed the love through um, for electronic music. Um, so exploring those kinds of genres, um, doing uh, like I have a whole rap thing, F E T T A, Feta, that I've done for a while. Um, mm-hmm. I've probably released like somewhere around 50 or 60 songs in these past couple of years. Um, I've kind of taken the back, putting that on the back burner now, now that I've been heavily focused on guitar, but anything's possible. I could just jump back on that, do a couple of songs or whatever. It's just, it, for me, it's, I just put it all on the table and wherever the cards are, whatever, however they face up or down, don't matter to me as long as it's all there, man. Absolutely. I think that's the way to do it. Uh, and realizing I skipped over the fact that uh, the Hot Me playthrough is one of my first videos ever. I think it's the first video I have in my, like, playlist on youtube of all the stuff that i've done and been a part of uh and that is number one in the playlist it is the first thing i've added to that playlist and so i think before that i had recorded myself playing guitar and done like done the process of editing a video but that was my first time doing it with a person that wasn't me uh so i think it was a big uh bit yeah kind of big beginning for me uh is there anything in construct paradise that stands out as like a high water mark for you as you look back and the yeah all the successes of it of there's yeah plenty of shows there's ep that comes out there's the mm-hmm. music videos like what stands out as yeah the high water mark the place that was the the night of the big success the peak of it for you um the peak of everything for me um would have to be um I actually um, wrote like an entire song for Construct Paradise, and we released a music video for it um, mm-hmm. called Wanderlust. Absolutely, yep. Um, and th- I guess that would be the peak for me because I've never like fully written something where like everyone was on board. Like we were like, "Yo, I had these real lyrics written, I had these guitar parts written and stuff," and they're like, "Yeah, dude, let's just do it." And I was like, "But you guys don't want to like let's edit it a little mm-hmm. bit." But no, mm-hmm. it's just like one of those things where like I had full creative control on that. It's cool. Um, so it was a really cool moment for me. Um, and and just filming the music video for that with Eric DiCarlo, which is a, he's a really cool guy too, was very mm-hmm. fun. Um. So it's just like stuff like that. It's just, you know, it's always going to be in, in my brain, in my memory. And it's always just going to be, it's going to, that, that to me was probably like the pinnacle, but I think all of it was just awesome. All of it was great. Even like the super negative times and stuff like that. I really learned, um, who I was and who I want to be as a person moving forward. So mm-hmm. I just see it all as a net positive brother. That's about it, man. Was Wanderlust before you started writing stuff kind of free flowing as you are now, or is that something that you would have written kind of of the times and would have written more sectionally? Definitely of the times sectionally. Yes, I would say so. I've always been an improv guy, but I mean, with, with construct paradise and all that stuff, it was all like sectioned out. This is mm-hmm. a chorus here. This is that, this is that, all that kind of stuff for sure. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I, I was assuming that was the case and there's mm-hmm. a part of my brain hoping you were like, no, I just restyled that. I'm like, no, what no, the that'd, fuck does that even that'd mean? That'd be crazy. No, <laughs> that'd be unbelievable. Not. Yeah. Some Definitely Beethoven some complicated shit. riffs on that. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, freaking all those old guys, Beethoven, Johann Sebastian Bach, Nicola Paganini, all those guys, man, it, you wouldn't believe it, but they freestyle all their stuff. It makes no sense to me. Yeah, the more I learn about the old world, the less sense any of this makes to me. And I've uh, I've joked that in learning 3D stuff and learning green screen stuff, right, I'm starting to build buildings and not literally, but I am uh, digitally recreating and appreciating how many bricks it takes and how often you have to lay a brick in order to have a building. And yeah. as I'm designing a city, it's like, there's a lot of street poles that go into a city and mailboxes and just like, mm-hmm. it's not just a building and a road, right? There's so many little pieces. And then I, that makes me go walk into, I'm um, drawing a blank, some old Capitol building. Yeah. And it's like, how the fuck did they make that? Like I, how is this possible? And then if we keep going back in time to the composers to, yeah, all mm-hmm. the, the Greeks, it's like, what the hell is it? How is this possible? How did people figure any of this out? And I guess maybe it takes us back to your your initial point of the layers of paint of like, if you just, if you're making something out of stone your whole life, you'll make some pretty cool shit out of yeah. stone. But that's not in our current zeitgeist too much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, as I start to make stuff digitally that I look at real stuff and go, what the fuck are highways? Mm-hmm. Who the fuck made a highway? How is it even possible no, to do? Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Infrastructure is pretty damn crazy, man. It's pretty damn crazy to think about um, how many components actually go into anything, whether it be infrastructure, music, mm-hmm. uh, a book, favorite poem or something. <laughs> I don't listen to poems, but you know what I mean? It's, it's, I'm sure it's all the same. Yeah. yeah. Um, hell yeah. Uh, I've been stumbling with this idea of like enriching my creativity. Uh, so this has been like a sticky note on my desk and it makes me laugh is like such an mm-hmm. absurd thing to like, I have goals of like do the laundry today, you know, whatever, Why edit not? this music video. And then the third thing on the list is enrich my creativity, which yeah. is such like an arbitrary statement. Um, but it is a, something I've been trying to think about of like, I'm aware that the ideas that come out of me are a product of what I consume. Uh, mm-hmm. and I, because of that, I think I should be aware of what I consume and try and curate that to then have the best thing come out of me. And I don't know exactly what that means, but I'm curious as an as an artist, as someone who is so improv, yeah, where do ideas come from from you? As How do you think these things flow through you? And are you like intentionally curating what you consume? Or is it, yeah, what do you like to consume and how does that come out of you? Um, consider the source, consider the muse. Um, some people call it the muse. Uh, some people call it a source. But for me... I try to, not even try to, I I just, I have to put my foot down and and say, these are not actually my ideas. None of the stuff I actually make is actually me. It's coming from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. It's coming, I'm I'm grabbing things in the air and all that good stuff. But yes, I am the vessel that it channels through, but I don't think that ideas, music and all this stuff, I don't think it comes from, I think it comes from a much, much higher place. I think there is something that connects all of us, whether it be um, a certain frequency or vibration um, that allows us to concoct all these ideas that come out of nowhere. But it's all, I think it's extremely collective, like where you're saying how like the certain music you want to consume for you to release a certain something. I take that super to heart, um, and especially in my day-to-day life. Um, so like I'll throw on like uh, like when I'm working or something, for instance, I'll throw on Stadium Arcadium by Red Hot Chili Peppers, two hour oh, yeah. freaking long album, man. Mm-hmm. One of my favorites. And I want to be like that music. I hear the lyrics in that music. The more I see, the less I know, the more I'd like to let it go. Like that's me. That's mm-hmm. the, the more I learn in life, the more I see in life, the more I just I don't know what it is. And I'm going to let it go. And I'm just going to keep being me and release whatever the hell comes to my brain. I guess that, to that point, then, how do you position yourself in a place to reach out and grab the best ideas? Like, I, I think I agree with you one. that we are like some, there's something passing through us. There's a quote I have on the wall over there that I like to read. And it's my, uh, I guess you can't see if you're watching it, but behind me is all my video gear. So as mm-hmm. I load out, I kind of load out from here and bring it upstairs. Yeah. So the last thing I see is this quote on the wall. Uh, and the one of the pieces of it is like, uh, because there's only one of you in all time, this expression is unique. And if you block it, the world will never have it. Uh, so it's yes. this idea of like, it does it, it's not, I can't decide if it's good. It's not my job to tell if it's good. It's my job just to let it happen. Mm-hmm. So I agree with you that there is something to be said there, but mm-hmm. I don't believe that it's impossible for me to affect. I believe that I have some ability to impact these ideas that I'm grabbing. And if you do, and so mm-hmm. as I'm wondering, yeah, how do I get myself? Is it a, how do you put yourself in a good headspace, I guess, then to grab the best ideas? And I think that's maybe a lifelong pursuit of like, it's not a daily thing. It's not like, I'm not going to have a good idea today, but it's, Mm -hmm. can I grab a good idea today so that I can grab a better idea tomorrow? But how do you position yourself to grab the best ideas as they're passing by you? Yeah. And, uh, I, yes. Um, 
to position yourself, I think, um, would be um, obviously like the things they, they come out from thin air and all that stuff. There's a source, uh, yada, yada, what mm-hmm. I just said. But you do physically have to make the base of everything. You do physically have to, like for me, I had to practice a million scales and, and mm-hmm. rehearse a million things for me to be able to improvise. So it's like, it's that whole like 10,000 hour, 10, hours thing or whatever. You just have yeah. to like, constantly work at your thing fall on your face get back up constantly do it even if you put it down for a year or whatever in that year that you put it down you maybe not might not know it but you're still learning things and you're going to apply that to your craft the next year so yeah i i think i this idea to me comes mostly from the idea of the yeah, 3d creation of green screen stuff of like if i can make anything then what do i want to make right because to this point before like green that. screen <laughs> there's this sense of like well, I'm kind of confined to the warehouse we're in. And I've used warehouse as an example. And yeah. I think that's kind of the classic metalcore, but For it sure. could be a house, it could be a yard, whatever. It could be a million things. Mm-hmm. Um, but now it's like, if I no longer have to worry about that, if I can just set up a green screen right where we're sitting right now and film a band and put them anywhere, where do I want to put them? And what does that look like? And if, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like if I, if I want to build the best idea, I'm aware that, yeah, how, what does that look like? What is the process and I think you're right that it's a it's a trial and error thing it's an mm-hmm. idea of getting more ideas flowing through me and building more stuff out um but like I've, I've tried reading more as like a way to just oh, like good. I my issue is like I don't necessarily want to I don't like watching a ton of movies I've never watched mm-hmm. a ton of movies and my issue is like I don't really want to just be creating what I saw in Inception right there's something finite there and by reading it forces me to imagine and that's inherently unique like whatever building I'm building in my brain is unique and that yeah. allows me to create Um, But yeah, are there other places you're exploring ideas? Is it, yeah, are you taking ideas just from music? Are you, yeah, for me, it's reading. It's somewhere I've tried to lean into to find more ideas. Mm -hmm. Where do you, do you try and find ideas? Do you seek out ideas? Uh, I would definitely say I'm more of a, like, uh, the ideas seek me kind of in a way uh, where I can be going about my day, driving my truck around for my job and all that kind of stuff. And Maybe something really negative happens to me that day and I get really pissed about it or I'm really mm-hmm. upset about it. Um, what Something that I take from that is like when you're really upset about something or something really affects you, give it an hour or two as you're continually doing physical labor to doing something to take your mind off it. Oftentimes, you'll think about that same thing and be like, dude, why was I even upset? Mm-hmm. So... Um, Certain things, just like the day to day, um, when you're walking down the street, like, uh, you know what, you know, it's a good one for me is when I go into like, uh, steel precision and manufacturing places, um, you hear like the worrying of like, uh, freaking conveyor belts and all that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, and almost gives me this feeling of like the old school, like British heavy metal. And I'm just, I start thinking about, um, freaking Saxon, Black Sabbath. I think about mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff and maybe I write something like that that day. That's or yeah. I see a certain abstract painting. Like, a, you ever seen like a Jackson Pollock where it's just like, mm-hmm. it's freaking... <laughs> <laughs> I, I think about stuff like that and that reminds me of like, like jazz music. That reminds me of like Miles Davis or something like mm-hmm. that. And then I'll listen, maybe listen to a couple of Miles Davis songs and then uh, hit up my keyboard in my studio make a little jazzy thing or whatever and then uh put it out there but like it's not just music man it's like life art Mm -hmm. it all imitates itself at the end of the day we're all just uh replicating life itself man Mm -hmm. literally whether it be the smallest thing we do or the biggest thing we do we just sometimes don't think about it which is i think not thinking about it is the thing kind of (laughs) you're probably right and that's one of those things that uh, not thinking about it is the thing is one of those sentences that like is in my head right now. And I'm going to be watching this back later today or tomorrow and editing and being like, Oh fuck. I didn't appreciate how wise that was. <laughs> um, do you ever have trouble then turning off that brain? Like it sounds like you're someone where ideas are always flowing through. And I'm, I think I'm a similar person of like, I, I always want to be working on something and tinkering and perfecting something or adjusting something or coming up. Like, I don't know. I just, I want to be improving and pursuing at all times. Um, but that gets tiring. I can't do that all the time. Yeah. And I find myself at a rut where it's like, I'm just creating for the sake of it. This isn't like a, a something mm-hmm. that's intuitively valuable right now. I'm just in the rhythm of doing it, so I'll keep doing it. And, of course, that's the time to take a day off and, yeah, let your juices flow. Uh, do you ever feel like you're good at taking a day off and letting juices flow? Do you need that often? How does that process happen for you? Uh, for me, I definitely need um, time to myself, whether it be my, my job, which is a little exhausting sometimes. Mm-hmm. I need to take a day off from making music or anything of that nature because my, my brain is tired. 
I mean, my body's tired. Um, but yeah, you need to sometimes put the brake in order to accelerate, basically, sometimes. I mean, you need to stop and then view your surroundings before you're going to tackle it again. But it's just like a, like um, like schoolwork or whatever. You like do the schoolwork or whatever, and you like you hate it or whatever the fuck. But like um, you do the schoolwork, and then you just you get better at the subject. So it's like even like um, I guess if you're pounding out a music video, and you might might be like, oh, dude, this is the laborious part. I got to do all this stuff or whatever. Through doing that a bunch, a bunch of times, even if you need to do it a hundred times, and it's all like, oh, dude, this is the laborious part. I bet one out of those a hundred times, you're like, dude, I whoa that's a new idea i never thought about man so it's like even in the mundane I'm so happy you said that yep that's exactly why my i try not to use presets i try not to use anything that is pre-made for that exact reason of like mm -hmm. it might suck to add a hundred of these animations to this but on the 73rd one i'm gonna misclick something and it's gonna open up this whole other like Oof. oh fuck why didn't i think of this angle of it first the mistakes uh, are beautiful man i'm with you 100 percent of like and i think i've cost myself time i think i've cost myself efficiency and now i'm getting to a point of like okay i don't need to make there's little graphics there's little noise textures where it's like i don't need to be going into after effects and trying to manually create my own film texture mm -hmm. i can just download a film texture it's the same shit like i don't need so there's places where i think i've done myself dirty by trying yeah. to do it all myself but the flip side is like I can make any noise texture I want now. I don't have to go find it. And it probably saves me time. But in the times where I, it's like, I need something grainy. I want a little more scratch. It's like, well, I can make that. Fuck, I don't need to worry about this. Uh, uh, one thing that opened my mind when it, with what you're saying right now, where you can make anything, is uh, one of my best friends growing up. Well, my best friend growing up, Jamie, mm -hmm. um, he's a DJ. He's a, he, he, he spins the tracks, all that good stuff. And he does a lot of uh, what you'd call sound design, where you take a freaking... Uh, it's so a, cool. A regular little boop, and then you make it into some crazy noise mm -hmm. using uh, manipulation of like the the waveform and all this stuff. And um, by being friends with my best friend, I mean like I learned so much about um, myself and how I can translate that into the guitar world. Because mm -hmm. like you think, okay, distortion clean, but there's in the middle of all that there's. Um, Delays that you can not just use as delays, but delays that accent different notes, which make a, a simple riff the craziest and coolest thing ever. Sometimes, you know, people like to be very technical and overexpressive, but listen to some of those like 2010 post hardcore bands or whatever, and then they have like simple, clean guitar riffs that are amazing and beautiful, and that's all that's needed sometimes. <laughs> Uh, to that end, like, uh, do you find yourself still learning? I guess what I'm hearing, or sorry, that's a very dumb question. What I meant by that, no dumb the better, I yeah, know that the, the, <laughs> the more articulate way to ask what I was trying uh -huh. to get out there, uh, is that what I'm hearing you say is like the best song isn't necessarily the fastest sweep or the nah. fastest tremolo. And, nah. uh, I understand that that's maybe not in the, the wheelhouse you're aiming for, but maybe in the melodic, it's like, it's not having the new chord. It's some way of making this chord interact with other chords that it hasn't before or something. I guess I'm wondering that, uh, yeah. So in that context, like, are you still learning music in that sense of like, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this question of like, when I'm, when I'm still learning video, it's like, I still have to learn more about how to make a building more real. Yeah. And that involves some level of like, well, what is texture? What is a brick? How do I make a brick? And I think in the context of guitar, it's like, I feel like you've learned what the frets are and what they do. And I don't know how you would further enrich that understanding in the way that I have to enrich what a brick is. It feels like what you're doing now is more of like, where does this house go? Where does this note go in the song? Which is a different process to me than the, the minutia of learning what the, 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 the seventh fret on the third string mm -hmm. does. Does that make any sense? Am I articulating no, I think, anything there? I think that makes perfect sense. Um, sometimes you need someone. Yeah. Sometimes you cannot do everything that you want to do in your brain. And for me, that person was Alan Holdsworth. Um, I listened to one, well, actually, I didn't even listen to Alan Holdsworth. I bought a seven string Carvin guitar a long time ago, and it's a beater guitar. Like, it like didn't, like the pickups didn't work. Uh, Freaking, it was like the, the routing for all the cavity pickups were all messed up and all this stuff. Um, so I had, I got it fixed. I was like, I'm going to refurbish this guitar, send it to a luthier. I got it fixed um, and all this good stuff. And then I got it back. And I didn't even realize on the, um, the headstock um, truss rod cover, it said Holdsworth. And I was like, oh, that's cool. It's just some dude or whatever. And then I look, I go on YouTube and I go, Alan Holdsworth. And I didn't know a guitar could be played like that. No idea that um, 
I'll have to look it up. Yeah, I'm, I have no idea. I'm yeah. curious. Well, he's 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 a he's a lot of guitarists' favorite guitarists. Steve, one of Steve Vai's mm -hmm. favorites. Um, notably known as like a very humble guy. But upon listening to his music, I realized literally anything's possible. He uh, allowed whatever the source is to just completely flow through him, and it just came out. There's no. There's no certain modes or scales that are used. Yes, there are kind of, mm -hmm. but it's all just extremely free form abstract. Um, and, you know, it's just sometimes you need someone to show the light. You can't just do it all yourself, man. <laughs> so, so I guess uh, to paraphrase or try to repeat back then, it's not necessarily there's a, a picking pattern or a chord that is the key to learning to you, but it's, yeah, consuming novel versions of art that are more novel than the ones you've had, and that's oh, the yeah. learning that you're doing more so. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, like uh, a big one for me is like when I when I first heard of Death Grips when I was a kid, um, I didn't know drums could be played like that. If you've never heard of like Zach Hill playing drums or any of the music that he creates, it's just, it's literally like... Um, it's like a, it's like an unhinged dude hitting the cans as hard and as fast as you can possibly do it whilst sounding amazing and articulate the mm -hmm. entire time. It's almost like controlled anger. And it's it's just when you see and hear new art forms like that, it just gives you so much inspiration. You can you can like even like the the like some of like the modern pop stuff, you can listen to a Justin Bieber song and be like, Oh dude, I see what you're doing there. That's pretty good. That's pretty mm -hmm. catchy. You know what I mean? You can find little things in everything, man. I've really enjoyed that as I get into the visual side of stuff of like I drive by billboards and I'm like, that's cool. And it's like it's the billboards to me are the most simple version of advertising, right? They're designed yeah. to be very quickly digestible for obvious reasons yeah, <laughs> uh, to for not sure. cause yeah, tra yeah. traffic jams and uh, crashes. Um, but like there's something very simple. And even in that, I look at it and go, oh, that's cool in a way that I never would have before. But I'm just mm -hmm. aware of how the, the sauce is made. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess what I'm hearing you say then, it's like there's not a, a, a certain picking pattern that you need to learn. But yeah, it's the, these bigger structures that are more inspiring to you. Yeah, I mean... Um one of my one of my biggest influences, Ingve Malmsteen, uh, sh top tier shredder, been since the '80s. When he goes to practice his guitar, it's just he practices. There's no set thing. It's not like okay, I'm gonna do a major scale, minor scale. Let's practice mm -hmm. the Lydian, all that kind of stuff. It's just zero to sixty, and I implement that with nearly all my practice sessions. I just sit down. It's whatever's coming to mind. Yeah, there's set stuff. There's some scales of course, and all yeah. that stuff, but. It's just all improvisational, and upon me playing the freaking guitar while my fiance is watching 90 Day Fiance <laughs> or something like that, <laughs> I, I just I hear something real quick, and I'm like, oh, I would have never done that if I didn't just sit down here and just practice for a little bit and mm -hmm. tweedle around. So just sometimes it's not about following the structure. Sometimes it's, it's just um, free-falling, and then while you're free-falling, make it look cool. I really tried to lean into that, that there is something in letting stuff go. And that's where all the, the good art is to some degree of like, mm -hmm. uh, this is my, my brain of analogies here, but I've been teaching myself golf over the summer. That was kind of my, oh, sweet, my dude. project of just go out once a week on a Wednesday or something and just like try something. Yeah. And quickly what you learn is like when you try and hit the ball hard, you fuck up, everything goes wrong. And when you just try and hit it like 90%, 80%, you just let yourself do the thing. It goes perfect. And not that that's hard and fast. I still mess no. up far more than it goes perfect. But there yeah. is something to be said in that little wisdom to me of like, and you're kind of saying the same thing with the guitar. It's like, yeah. as you try and force it, there becomes something that just doesn't work anymore. And then by taking it down just a half step, you end up making it so much better than it would have been. And that's yeah. something I really struggle with of like, I don't want to be complacent. I don't want to, in the context of coming with a music video idea, right? And to go back to writing a treatment, it's like to some degree, as I'm writing a treatment, that determines the next two months of my life, right? It determines what I'm going to be working to do in a month and then what I'm going to be working on for the month after that. Uh, and so as I write a treatment, there is a real sense of like, I need this to be good. I need it to be creative and unique and eye-catching. And I need it to catch your attention to the beginning and hold your attention to the end, to put a twist at the end. And like, there's a mm -hmm. hundred things I'm trying to do. And I think you're right. There is some power then in being like, just what's cool, what's interesting to me. Yeah. But the 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 challenge there to me is always in like it it feels like a lazy approach, and I don't know how to do it in a way I that see. feels like intentional and direct and creative and valid valid instead of like an excuse to just like write an empty music video treatment. You know, and there's a, a real mm -hmm. fine line there that I'm always trying to negotiate. Like I don't want to force an idea. But I also don't want to just go with the first idea that comes to my brain because that's everyone else's first idea. And who cares about that idea? You, 
ACDC, man. Some of those riffs you hear, you're like, oh, I could do that or whatever. <laughs> but then listen to Thunderstruck. Digga, 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 All that kind of stuff, man. Mm-hmm. You'd be surprised. If through simplicity comes the most complex things. Yep. And through the mundane of you working through it, you're going to find those abstract <laughs> parts of it, whether it be the most simple thing. So, cause sometimes the most simple things are like abstract as hell, man. I have a music video coming out uh, and I've been kind of alluding to it. And I can't really say much about it here publicly. I'm happy to talk afterwards about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the, the private is, yeah, it's fully green screen. And so it's a fully composite of the band in green screen. It's the oh. first like hundred percent version of that, that I've done where I've done Way little cool. like green screen scenes. And this is the first, uh-huh. like, I was like, no, we're not doing anything. Like I, I made it a point of like, we could do this little piece practical, but no, nah, I want to do it all digital. Uh, I think and, Peter's going to show me a little bit of it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll leak it. Yeah, sorry, sorry in advance. Um, but we definitely could. Uh, but my that was something that we filmed, and as we filmed it, I knew mm. half of what we were going to make. Like yeah. we really didn't know what the music video was as yeah. we were filming it because it was on the back of another project that got delayed and blah blah blah. So yeah, by sounds time, like the usual stuff. <laughs> it was, and it was. I'm very much a planner, right? Especially with green screen. Green screen is a very much a planning oriented thing of like, I don't think there's a lot of room for creativity in it. It's a lot about getting stuff right. And then in the post, I can be creative, but Mm -hmm. with the actual physical green screen and the lighting, it's just about doing it right and not having reflections from the green screen and making the green screen evenly lit so that it's easy to take care of later. And I don't know, there's a lot of bullshit that isn't fun. It's not cool, Mm -hmm. but it's really important. Uh, And we were doing all that without the sense of like, I don't totally know what I'm trying to put you into. We're just kind of yeah. filming a video and I'll figure it out later. And I think it came out great. I think it came out awesome, but it was to your point of like this, uh, we had to kind of let it go. There was no, op- yes. there wasn't time to plan. I didn't have that option that I normally rely on. And when we were forced to just make something happen, something really cool happened and I'm really happy with it. Um, and yeah, I'm always trying to balance that. Like I don't want to be unprepared and just wing it, mm-hmm. but by micromanaging it, by setting up every little detail, you're right. It probably does water it down to some degree. Dude, I had a, um, I had a notebook that I wrote down a couple of uh, topics on that I was going to bring here. But midway through the drive, I was like, oh, I left it on my coffee table. <laughs> so it's just, it is what it is, man. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, if you want to <laughs> refill or anything, feel free to help yourself. We got oh, yeah, plenty there for you. Um, if there's anything on the notebook. Empty, man. <laughs> I knew, you knew I, I was empty, man. <laughs> I heard it. I feel it. Um, <laughs> Or well, is anything on that notebook that you want to bring up? Feel free to to interject here. Um, my as we come up on our hour here, actually we're at like fifty five ish minutes or so. Um, my oh Jesus Christ, what are right? you talking about? Time flies, dude. Jesus Sick as hell. Um, uh, the other piece of the creativity here is I uh, or enriching the creativity. My note uh, is that last night I went to the current show. I guess it was technically the Polaris headliner, yeah. um, but they're at cool the Palladium dudes. sold out. The best. Uh, and I realized I hadn't been to a, the Palladium main stage in a while. It's been a long time since I was there. Yeah. And even longer since I was there just watching the show, right? Like if I'm going all the way to the Palladium from here, normally I'm shooting. If I'm going to just hang out, sometimes about the webs are hanging out. But even then, I'm usually shooting if I'm at a show. Uh, and it was really nice to just like be in the middle of the crowd and like appreciate all of the people that love currents. And I think I've, yeah. I've sat and chatted with them here and like they are they are people to me. They are normal guys. And For sure. I like their music and I recognize that what they're doing is larger in life, but there was something mm-hmm. really cool about being a fly on the wall, so to speak, amongst the 2000 Currents fans. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's something I've tried to connect with it myself is like, be aware of that 16 year old version of me that would have been there and would have been in line at 3 p.m. in the afternoon just to try and get to the barricade. And like, so true. I try and stay connected to that part of me. Uh, I think that's a valuable thing. I think maybe perhaps the one drawback there or the one flip side to that coin is like, I also want to be open to new inspiration. I don't want to be set in like my glory years and uh, opposed to new ideas. Uh, how much is that something you try and find yourself tuning into like the, the, yeah, the teenage years where you were 13, 14 and this thing wasn't real yet, but it was beautiful as euphoric. And of course, as you talk about the ups and downs of construct paradise and yeah, being in the music industry that we've all had, it's like you start to realize that it's not always perfect, that it's not always yeah. glam, but I don't want to be jaded by that. I want to appreciate this beautiful world that my 14 year old self thought it was. Mm-hmm. But I also think it's not really realistic and I want to be an mm-hmm. adult and take adult perspective in. Yeah. How do you kind of balance these two kind of yin and yang? Uh, I think you have to maintain balance and composure whilst realizing that part of you will come out. Mm-hmm. No matter what you do in your yeah. life, that part of you is always there, but you have to maintain balance and composure. Um, in this anxiety-filled world, man, you got to try to stay yeah. still a little bit. So I like that. You got to try and stay still a little bit. 
Yeah, I like that. I feel like I'm always kind of wandering and looking for something. And I think you're right. There is something to be said of, yeah, staying still. It's hard. Bit. It's hard, man. Sometimes yeah. I have a hard time uh, just staying still and um, being like putting my foot down. This is what I want to do. Um, but it comes naturally as you get older. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm almost 28 now. I'm 27. Mm-hmm. Um, so I still have a lot of years to go. And But I'm fortunate enough to have had such a condensed life where I've done so much in those years that... I have these experiences to bring forth with me the next time I do something. So, yeah. you know, uh, me and my friend Shane, we're making some cool Perfect music segue, right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was leading us there, so you're right on my track. Hell yeah. Yeah, uh, me and Shane are making some real cool music now. So we're making some melodic, uh, progressive style music. Mm-hmm. We're going to have some awesome-ass clean vocals in there and stuff like that. We've already have almost two songs done. So it's like one of those things where it's like it's starting organically, we're two cool, even-headed dudes um, that really vibe off of each other. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, uh, not sometimes, that is needed. Um, when you go into ventures with people, you need to find people that are similar um, emotionally to you as well as what their eventual goal is, whether it be yeah. like, I'm steadfast and this is going to be the goal, or whether it be, mm-hmm. no, take it how it goes. This is the path. You need to find oh, yeah. people that are like-minded with you. Um because um, like we were talking about before, man, you have to have the base before you can uh, create the mountain and then ascend the mountain. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Shane's a friend of the show. He's been on here before. I'm hoping to have him back again. And yeah, he's the absolute man. Uh, has it been tough to introduce someone else to a project where you've been so improv and so freeform and so independent for a while? Has it been tough to collaborate and introduce someone else to the process? Uh, I would say this is the most uh, seamless uh, project I've ever done. Me and oh, yeah. him, just we start out making music. Like me and him just started, we, we, we got together, we sat down, we're like, all right, let's, what's going to sound cool, man? Let's mm-hmm. put a smile on our face. That's basically it. Yeah. So He's the best. Yeah, he's a he's a fun guy to put a smile on his face yeah oh yeah man it's 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 needed you know like um in in my life i've had a lot of uh dark times that i've uh, a lot of times created for myself all that kind of stuff but um through emerging out of that i'm 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 like a i'm like a pretty even keeled guy nowadays Mm -hmm. i'm pretty positive about stuff and i want to find other people like that because um like you were saying before your your environment affects you whether you like it or not the music you consume whether you like it or not um Mm. for me like death metal gives me a little bit anxiety that kind of thing so i had to stay a little bit away from it i know that consciously for myself so it's like one of those things where it's like you got to know yourself uh create the tribe of people that you want to be surrounded with and then uh kick life's butt <laughs> <laughs> in that order hell yeah i love that dude that's a great little great sentiment for us to to kind of move on from uh last little question here as we wrap up 100%. Uh, i like to li- learn about life outside of music so we talked all about the all the guitar everything every string every that we've plucked in our yeah, whole yeah, lives yeah, yeah, yeah. uh what else is interesting to you outside of music is is music the only thing we're doing are there other hobbies are you rock climbing are you building woodwork what else is happening outside of life in music or what's ap- in music out whatever you know what i'm trying Dude, to say totally <laughs> totally um during the pandemic i got into like fish keeping and stuff like that cool, it was okay. kind of something i liked when i was a kid and yeah. i was just like oh dude let me get back into it and unfortunately i, ha- I have some money nowadays yep. like in terms of like the job i do and stuff yeah. so like, i got way too into it i got like coupled way too many tanks and that what kind are of talking, stuff like, yeah. five tanks ten tanks a uh, thousand bro, fish hundred fish like yeah we're talking like one two three like like five tanks at one point yeah. in my apartment and i was just like oh no how many fish are we talking ah bro like i don't know like somewhere in the vicinity of 20 or 30 or something like Hell that. Yeah, okay, so okay. some snails in there, some shrimp. Nice. But, uh, freaking, so I got into that, but um, me getting into that and then having that fuse kind of just like expire really quick made me realize how much I need guitar and how much I love making music. So for me, uh, it was very transformative in the fact that like, that's kind of like my only hobby, Peter, is music, bro. Mm-hmm. To be honest with you, man, like it's I work, I do, uh, I have, I you know, I have, I have fun with my, my 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 best friends, Eddie, Isaac, Jamie, my uh, Shane, my my uh, fiance, Jenna, and all that good stuff. Congratulations, by uh, the way, on uh, the fiance. That's awesome. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, but yeah. I'm the same way. I feel like I, I make videos and I work and I go to concerts and like everything I do is kind of in this bubble and I'm actively that's where golf came from is an active effort of like i need to do something that's not in this universe yeah uh golf to me was a way that's independent i can just go do it and it's it's hard and i'm bad at it and i did it like a little as a kid so i have like some baseline where it's like i'm at least familiar with what to do and yeah how this thing goes 
Uh, but it was, yeah, an effort of me of like, I need, I think you're right that in fish keeping, uh, and it sounds like, yeah, it didn't turn out to be a lifelong passion, but it was yeah. a window and you learn in it. Uh, I think, yeah, in pursuing anything, there's value and just in letting yourself go down that road and figure out what this thing is. And yeah, I think there's value in, in pursuing those ideas. Dude, go- golfing is going to make you a better videographer. Absolutely. It, 100%. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it correlates if you put it on paper, uh, but it does. It's a hundred percent. It stuck with me all summer. I, as I start golfing, you think that everyone else in the golf course is, is Tiger Woods. You think that everyone else is like an expert. It turns out that most people there are not that good. Most of the courses I'm going to are pretty basic entry level golf courses. And most mm-hmm. people there are like me, but the, the issue in my head there is like, I'm going by myself. I'm walking and it feels like everyone is looking at me going, he sucks. He's the worst golfer. He's ruining our day. He's ruining the course. He's making everything, sl- whatever. None mm-hmm. of the stuff that was actually happening, right? It's all in yes. my own head. But what, I realized is part of golf then for me was getting to the ball and going, I'm the only person on this golf course. This is my whole universe. It's just me and this little ball. I'm going to hit the ball towards the hole and it's going to go good or it's going to go bad, but it's going to go and I'll, I'll (laughs) figure it out from there. And that exercise I think is a really valuable one for me of being on set of a music video. And it's like, Mm -hmm. this is all going wrong. I can't do this. This light's not working. This person's late. And it's like, it sucks. It, mm-hmm. It's just me and this golf. It's just me and my camera right now. There is nothing to do. And I think you're right that like, it, I I hope that hitting a golf ball never affects my ability to do a music video. Like I hope I never have to do that because I'll fuck up that music video. But like the <laughs> the mentality of it, the principles of it, I agree 100. percent Yes, are valuable and worth yeah worth learning in golf because it will help me in video. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you, yeah, you never realize how much um, how much overthinking you do. Uh, cause a lot of us artists, um, cause you're an artist too. We mm-hmm. tend to be overthinkers. Oh, yeah. Um, you never realize how much you sit there and just kind of think about like, Oh dude, uh, I didn't do this. I didn't do that. Yep. Oh shoot. Oh, I could have done that so much better, but that's uh, golf has no room for that. Right. I can't get to the, if I'm getting the next ball thing about how bad my last ball was and it's going to go even worse. And like it forces mm-hmm. that also exercise of like sucks, move on. And, uh, and you were saying that you're you're saying how like you think other golfers are like oh dude this guy sucks or whatever and <laughs> all that stuff but it's crazy when you realize in your life that everyone has an ever so complicated life and they all have their own issues that they're dealing with yeah. so when you're doing your job or whatever and you say hi hey how's it going and the guy doesn't say hi back it's not because he didn't want to say hi back it's because he's everyone's going through something everyone's going and they're thinking about a million yeah. things that they're doing so everyone's got their own little world man yeah or i'd argue that it's I, I think i would push back i think i agree with you and i would just mm-hmm. change the the angle of it it's like i think if you if you say hi to me and he doesn't say hi back it is that he doesn't want to say hi back but that's because someone didn't say hi to him for most of his life that could, that could like be an, that, to him. you're right you're, you're uh, not wrong and you're so not i wrong. think that sometimes that it's a conscious choice we don't even realize where this conscious choice was where he goes why is this fucking kid saying hi to me fuck this kid mm-hmm. and it's because when he was a kid someone yeah gave him that same energy of absolutely. fuck that kid absolutely uh, man and yeah i guess i'm uh, i'm a psychology interested person i think i always end up at the childhood the kind of foundational point of like there's something there. There's something. Oh, uh, yeah. You mentioned Rogan earlier. And I think one thing uh, Rogan has always stuck with me it's somewhere in his comedy of all things that draw inspiration from. He said something about the fact that we're all just uh, grown babies. We're all just babies that stayed alive for really long and just kept <laughs> becoming bigger and bigger. Absolutely. Uh, and something of that is very freeing of like, oh, yeah, no one has this like, uh, I don't know, like, Tom Brady isn't a good football player. Tom Brady is a baby who played football for a long time mm-hmm. and became something that we think he is, but he still is, yeah, just Absolutely that big true. baby. Um, that's been, I don't know, helpful for me to realize that we're all all human and all mortal in that sense. Mm-hmm. Um, mission accomplished, dude. Uh, episode 43, in the bag. Anything um, anything you want to plug in the way out of here? So we have the YouTube, the Instagram Remind people again, what is the Instagram where people find you? Uh, you can find me on everything as Federico Zuccarelli Official on Instagram or YouTube. Um, and then I released one track called Daisy. You can find that on all platforms, iTunes, Spotify, whatever the hell. Um, and I'm going to be releasing more tracks uh, as they come. And uh, you're going to see uh, a bunch of I, – I drop music video, I drop music like – every two or three days or whatever yep. so you'll see constant music coming out of me absolutely i love it uh with shane anything we can say about timeline ish is there any set of like we'll have a song in the next six months in the next year is it we'll have a song when a song is ready what does that timeline there, looks like there is no timeline because we are creating our own timeline perfect love that 
Uh, that's another one to unpack later. <laughs> I'll figure out. Uh, hell yeah, if you made it this far, uh, I've been really bad at asking people to like, like, comment, subscribe, and all this shit. It feels so vain. Not but even. It does help. So if you made it this far, if people are still watching, please, yeah, leave a like, comment, subscribe, tell everyone they're awesome. You better. Uh, tell Federico. He's great. Shoot him a message. Thank <laughs> you for coming here. Uh, mission accomplished, dude. Episode 43 in the bag. <laughs>